In the arena where strength knows no bounds, I stand among the modern day titans. And at the core of our extraordinary prowess lies the nuanced dance of nutrition. Welcome to episode four of No Stone Unturned, where together we'll dissect the pivotal role nutrition plays in the world of strength athletes. Join me in this culinary exploration where every bite is a step closer to unlocking the nutritional harmony that fuels the extraordinary strength and resilience of strongmen. This series is brought to you by Perfect Sports, Canada's number one supplement brand, now available worldwide. If you check the description, there's a code for 30% off if you live in Canada and a link to international distribution if you live anywhere else in the world. Not only were they the first ones to bring New Zealand whey protein to North America, but they make, in my opinion, the best pre-workout I've ever had, and you can get all of your dietary staples through Perfect Sports. At the end of each video, I'm gonna provide a score based on three crucial aspects. Personal experience, the scientific evidence, and the practicality for the average athlete. You'll be able to compare it to other dimensions in this series, and hopefully at the end, you get some practical takeaways to improve your own training. Our journey begins with a diet overhaul led by none other than the world's strongest bodybuilder and world-renowned nutrition expert, Stan Efferding. A scholar of not just nutrition, but also exercise science, Stan shares his nutrition wisdom with me. Before we get into the extra 5% with Stan, let's talk about the fundamentals of nutrition. We have first our macronutrients, our carbohydrates, which are the primary energy source after the first five seconds of movements. We have fats, which are a huge component of cell health, regeneration, healthy skin, healthy nails, healthy hair, healthy joints. And then we have protein. And everyone knows that protein is made to repair particularly damaged muscle tissue, which is of high importance to us. If you get the macronutrients right, you're gonna be in a very, very good place and couple that with whole foods that provide micronutrients on top of the macronutrients and you probably have all of the information you already need. In the end, when it comes to weight loss and weight gain, you cannot get away from energy balance. Calories in and calories out will forever dictate how your weight moves on the scale. If you wanna find out if you're gaining or losing weight or if you're eating too many calories or eating too few calories, it's as simple as stepping on the scale. If the scale is going up, you're eating too much. If the scale is going down, you're not eating enough. Now that the common sense practical advice is out of the way, let's see what the fringes of high performance nutrition when it comes to the strength world, let's see where they exist. Let's see what Stan has to say. And let's head over to Columbus, Ohio, where we're speaking to Stan at the Arnold Strongman Classic. Let's just go over, you get someone like me coming to you as the current world's strongest man. What are some of the first things that you're looking for when giving a diet? Well, you were easy because you already wanted what I try and offer. And that was, you said, Stan, I want to get bigger and stronger, but I don't want to get fat. Uh, and that fits right into the mold that I've been working on for many years because I've been there. I uh, always say that uh, if I knew then what I know now, and I dirty bulked many times and got up to over 300 pounds and uh, I saw all of the problems. And so that's what I focus on first and foremost is, uh, is, uh, is kind of mitigating damage along the way. We just discussed before we got on camera here that um, uh, you know, fitness and health are not the same thing. Uh, health is being free from illness or injury and uh, show me somebody who's never been injured, I'll show you somebody who's never won anything. And fitness, the ability to perform a particular duty or task, the ability to become the world's strongest man is not necessarily healthy. Uh, and we would say that about just about any sport, whether it's UFC, whether it's even a 14 year old gymnast at the Olympics or a 10 year old badminton player in China blowing out a lateral collateral ligament. Uh, we take our bodies to places that, uh, that aren't necessarily healthy. And so the first thing I, I wanna do is be able for you, as we've discussed all the way up to this competition, is get there healthy. Uh, but then also long-term. We don't want to do any permanent damage or uh, you know, not make it there. First of all, I think something where everyone who I work with, I, I say, like, I'm a human being first. I'm not a robot who's going to have everything. It, for example, I told you in the mornings, I just got to get up and get going. I can't be spending 45 minutes on cooking X, Y, and Z. Got to go. So the first thing I have in the morning is my protein shake. Uh, I have my orange juice and yogurt, and I've got some free carbs throughout the day, so I might have rice, rice cakes or some form of cereal, something like that. 
Um, I think one thing that people have got really excited about that I've posted is the orange juice and yogurt, which by the way, I've become a huge advocate of, and I'm like, I absolutely love it. And almost everyone I tell says, surely that must be disgusting. Be like, no, it's actually really good. Where'd you get that from? Uh, boy, I got to think back. I, I, I don't even necessarily recall where originally it came from. It was so many years ago. Um, but I got to tell you that, that that's John Jones's favorite. That's uh, Gordon Ryan's favorite. That's, uh, you know, just all the people I've had the chance to work with over the years. They just love the OJ yogurt shake. Yeah. Uh, one thing in particular was uh, yogurt. Um, yogurt is, is, is a superfood. It's amazing. Uh, Stu Phillips, McMaster's University, PhD, um, muscle physiology. Uh, he talks about dairy in general as being um, a uh, superior to an equivalent amount of protein uh, for BMI uh, from other sources for BMI and for performance. Uh, so dairy has a, a special effect and, and we might suggest if we're going to dabble in mechanisms that uh, maybe it's, it's uh, IGF-1 uh, increase maybe potentially that that's it. So now how much yogurt can you sit there and eat because I want you to eat a lot. Uh, more the better. Yeah. It, to me, that's kind of one of, you know, we always did the go mad. It was the gallon of milk a day when yeah. I was, <laughs> yeah. you know, but I got yeah. fat as hell because I was drinking whole milk, you know, whole milk, go mad. <laughs> and, and again, not demonizing fats. I, I, I think fats are very important to a point. Yeah. Uh, obviously important for hormones, important for sleep, important for ADE and K absorption, you know, vitamin absorption. So I have fats in every meal. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to look at macros, we talked about calories are king. You got to be in a surplus. And so then we go down to macros. And uh, the fat macro, I kind of try and keep it under 20%, which is hard to do, so yeah. that I've got more room for protein and then carbs. I want carbs around 50, 60%. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just to touch really quickly on protein before I go back to the yogurt OJ shake, uh, since we're hitting on macro percentages, I don't need as much protein in a calorie surplus uh, because right. the carbohydrates are protein sparing. And um, uh, so I don't need to do a gram per pound, particularly for a 300 plus 400 pound athlete. I don't, I don't need to be there. Uh, and the main reason I talk about that is because it can be satiating. And at this point, it's hard to get enough calories in. Yep. Uh, it's one of the biggest struggles for big athletes is just eating enough. And we'll get to satiety a little later. Uh, but the benefit was is that I wanted to eat a lot of yogurt. So uh, the orange juice just became a vehicle, sure, really, okay, just right. to drink it rather than <laughs> have to sit there and eat it. Yeah, you know? Yeah. I mean, that takes yeah. us to now I have two of my lunches are Monster Mash. Yeah. And this is probably... This is probably what made you infamous yeah, in yeah. particular. I'll so, tell you how this, this one, I remember how it, it well, emerged. Well, <laughs> before, for people who don't know what it is, yeah. we've got uh, rice, uh, ground beef is what I usually use. Yeah, lean beef. Yeah. Uh, broth and uh, You can throw some, in an egg-egg white blend. You can throw in a, a, a spinach, a diced yeah. spinach or peppers. The peppers have twice the vitamin C of an yeah. orange. And, uh, so you can, however you prefer. Tell me the tell me the monster mash story. Okay, uh, I had some gum surgery uh, many years ago. This has been 15 plus years ago. Uh, I had some receding in my gums, and so I had a gum surgery. Well, they scrape the roof of your mouth to get uh, the uh, skin to to graft into your gums. Oh, right. And that's the worst part. Yeah. The the grafting itself by the next morning when you wake up, it, it doesn't really hurt. Yeah. The roof of your mouth is horrible. It's the pain is unbelievable. You can't swallow. You can't run your tongue against it, yeah. uh, and you can't eat anything because you're constantly rubbing your tongue against the roof of your mouth. But I thought, well, why wouldn't I just you know make up something that was almost liquid that I could pretty much not have to chew. Yeah. And just basically tilt my head back and swallow. Yeah. Um, and, and then you look at the research on sumo wrestlers. I know people, well, the fat. Um, they're some of the most heavily muscled, powerful people on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and they purposely overeat. Uh, and they use those big bowls of broth and vegetables and rice, and they consume you know, a massive amount of calories, yeah. uh, much like you would if you were at a, a hot dog eating competition, they dip it in water first, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And it just, mechanically speaking, it just facilitates your ability to consume more food in one sitting so that you're not sitting there just chewing and swallowing. Wow, so then that's breakfast, that's lunch one, lunch two, post-workout, I told you I have my smoothie. Convenience-wise, that's just what I have to do. Yeah. Is there any real objection to post-workout protein, OJ, fruits, smoothie? No, and I know that uh, the scientific community has talked about there not being a, 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 an anabolic window, and you don't need to jam down protein immediately after a workout. And you know, my answer to that is nobody ever got big not eating. 
Yeah. And yeah. we have a, a, a different demand on us. You know, calories are king. We've got to get so many meals in a day. Yeah. Um, and so there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking in protein and carbs post-workout. It's just another feeding opportunity to get more calories in. This takes us to dinner. <clears throat> and we actually have to go back to supplements in a second, but it takes us to dinner. And dinner, I find, is the hardest one to actually have a prescribed X is for dinner because you're with your family and what's yeah. made is what's made. What are some strategies that you try to use or advise people to use to stick as best as possible to a prescribed dinner? Well, if we're still, if we're still talking about the weight gain athlete, then yep. again, you know, calories are king. And so now I've, I've got a, uh, dinner time is usually when I eat my salmon. It's one of my favorite meals. I make yeah. that in that ninja grill and it, it's unbelievable. Uh, I've never been a good salmon cooker and never enjoyed it because I always taste fishy until I use that ninja grill and right. it's just amazing. It's okay. nice and crisp on the outside, still tender on the inside. It's great. Um, so that's usually the time I'll eat that. And, uh, uh, you know, at nighttime, it's, uh, it, since you have the night to sleep, uh, the potato is a good time to eat that because potatoes are pretty satiating. Uh, if, on the satiety index, they, they use a, uh, have done some studies and they have a satiety index where they measure how long certain foods keep people full. Okay. And uh, fruits are on there, oranges are on there, but not orange juice. That's kind of why I choose orange juice over oranges. It's just, again, a satiety, difference in satiety. Uh, when I'm doing weight loss programs, I'm doing bo lots of boiled potatoes, and maybe even cooled, so that it increases the, the amount of resistant starch. When you cool a potato, it increases the resistant starch. And so uh, I'm generally recommending that if, if an athlete that's trying to gain weight is eating a potato, to eat it at right after they cook it, yeah. and then either eat it uh, uh, two hours before a workout because you'll be hungry by the time you're done training yeah. or eat it with dinner because okay. you'll be hungry again in the morning because yeah. those keep you full longer. Um, now that, that pretty much rounds out my diet. I've got a shake at night, yogurt, OJ. Cool. But there's two supplements where you said from day one, like we got to be yeah. taking these, uh, vitamin D and uh, magnesium. Talk to me about those two. Why are they non-negotiable? And you're very particular about time of day on them as well. Yeah, hard to get from food is one of the big challenges uh, to get sufficient vitamin D, particularly in, in your climate up in Canada. Yeah. Uh, I lived in Seattle for 20 years. And it's a, uh, where's that uh, seasonal affective disorder capital of the world? You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seattle yeah, and Vancouver, BC. Yeah. Everybody up there is on uh, antidepressants. Uh, vitamin D, the sun vitamin, the hormone, uh, pro-hormone. Um, it, uh, I, I have seen consistently, and I've experienced myself with blood testing, that it, it can be low with athletes in particular. Now, there's some discussion as to whether or not it's a marker or a maker of, of disease. And, uh, um, uh, but if it's below 30, it makes sense to bring that up. Now, if your vitamin D is 50, bringing it up to 70 or 80 or 90 is probably not going to give you any additional performance benefits. So I don't want to suggest that, that uh, you know, megadosing vitamins is a, is a good plan. Yeah. That magnesium is also hard to get from the diet. Okay. Um, it's better to take vitamin D every day instead of once a week in a megadose. It seems like it's absorbed better. And this is uh, just from my experience and some anecdotes, and I've seen other people make the same claim uh, in the in the multivitamin industry. Probably Chris Masterjohn is one. I think I heard it from uh, PhD Nutrition. Uh, is that if you take vitamin D right before bed, it may impair sleep. And okay. so I suggest taking that in the morning. Magnesium, just the opposite. When you take magnesium with dinner, it seems to help sleep. Sure. Uh, and uh, I want to try and remember the type of magnesium because there's many, many types. Uh, um, magnesium glycinate, I think, is the one I currently take. Mm -hmm. There's multiple types. Some might increase uh, or cause a loose stool. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you got to kind of be, and some are less absorbable than others. Um, I have kind of a magnesium cheat sheet in my vertical diet 4.0 ebook and uh, I send people that information for them to go over but it's hard, sure. to, hard to remember all the specifics all the time. Yeah, of course. But those are the two that the foundation mm -hmm. and then beyond that I, I'm just it would be dependent upon if you had a, an identified deficiency and um, maybe a blood test so it's, it's maybe using a chronometer chronometer it's a it's an app that uh, tracks your food and it actually gives you micronutrient amounts. Oh, wow. Okay. So if you put all your food into this, uh, this chronometer, or, uh, I don't know how it's pronounced, chronometer, uh, it can tell you if you have a significant deficiency. Usually not a problem with guys like us who are eating as many yeah. calories as we eat. I only yeah. see that in, in restrictive diets uh, where, where 
micronutrients become a problem. Yeah. My experience with nutrition stretches way before I reached out to Stan and started Strongman, all the way back when I was 16. In fact, I thought the job that I wanted at first was a nutrition or a dietitian of sorts. It started because I wanted to look good. I was training hard and I really enjoyed the gym. And of course, I wanted a girlfriend, AKA get shredded, get big, and try to appeal to the opposite gender. To be honest, as I trained more and more and more, it just didn't work. I went from uh, 200 pounds to 210, 220, 230. And when I finished college football, I was around 245 pounds. From there, I totally fell off the rails, went all the way up to 300 pounds, and then I dieted down to a bodybuilding show. This basically comprised of 16 months of salmon, vegetables, chicken, and eggs. That was my entire diet for the better part of 14 to 16 months. After that, I pivoted straight to marathon running where carbohydrates were king and I needed to get carbohydrates in as much as possible. My energy expenditure was really, really high. And so I needed to find any way possible to replace that. This consisted of energy gels while I was running, uh, a lot of bananas. And I remember many times I felt totally out of energy after a run, little lightheaded, little woozy. I'd put together a peanut butter sandwich with honey and, and banana, and I would have three or four of those just trying to get the calories back in. The funny thing is when I stopped running and I went to strength sports, the diet didn't change that much, just my energy output changed a lot. So drop the energy output, keep the energy input the same and your weight starts to climb. Protein was definitely more of a focus all the way through my strength career as I went from a 225 pound marathon runner up to a 264 pound national powerlifting champion. I got stuck there for quite a while before I started working a little bit harder on force feeding myself. And once I did, I started to balloon up and up and up and up. And I basically landed at 315 pounds over the course of five or six months. During this time, I was eating 4,500 to 5,000 calories. And before you guys comment and say that you eat that much and you're small, whatever, my metabolism and my general movement is clearly lower. It has to be lower for the energetics to work. I am someone designed to be a larger person. If I wasn't competing in strongman, I think I would naturally comfortably sit around 215 pounds rather than 325 pounds right now. That was my experience with nutrition and I really didn't take it all that seriously all the way through World's Strongest Man uh, in 2022. I basically ate like a normal person and just ate a little bit more and had a little bit more protein, had an extra protein shake and that was it. I, I still ran the clinic every day. I still had business to run. I still went about my day-to-day -day life and you probably wouldn't notice if you spent 24 hours with me that I was a strong man or that I was eating gargantuan amounts of food because for me, that was just never the reality. The biggest thing that I've noticed in working with Stan though is I've taken some of the food that was higher calorie density and I've changed it to healthier, lower calorie density foods. So I don't feel like I've ever eaten as much as I have in the past three or four months that we've cleaned up my nutrition. That's my experience all the way up to contacting Stan. So let's go back to Stan and find out exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it. All right, so everything we've talked about is about a high performance athlete trying to gain weight, but I find it a, a huge responsibility on myself where what I'm doing is not the healthiest thing and we're not chasing health, we're chasing performance and trying to mitigate health factors and negative health consequences that come from it. What are a few of your best tips for the general person, the general sedentary-ish person just trying to be healthy? What's your best diet advice for them? A few tips. Well, general sedentary person trying to be healthy, we're still focusing on sleep. We're still taking the 10 minute walks after meals when we get to diet. Uh, generally speaking, if they're carrying excess body fat, that's the first thing we wanna focus on. We talked about for athletes, they, they have to get a lot of calories in to fuel their workload and their body mass. For the general population, typically they wanna lose weight, get into a calorie deficit, a small calorie deficit. Uh, so they need to focus on satiety. And we discussed a little earlier that small changes that I made between say ground beef and, and top sirloin steak and getting rid of the rice and throwing in a, a salad and uh, getting rid of the juice and throwing in fruit, uh, those three small changes. So I'm focused mostly on satiety. I'm looking at that satiety index. I'm looking at raising their protein. I said in a calorie surplus, I could bring it down 0 0.8, 0 0.7 grams per pound. Uh, uh, with somebody that's trying to lose weight, I'm using the thermic effect of food from protein and the satiety benefit of protein to raise those calories up, which helps me bring down others. Uh, and I'll use more uh, foods that take longer to digest, higher fiber foods, 
to help satiate those folks. Um, and then still we're looking at trying to get a, a variety of proteins, say from an egg egg white blend or a top sirloin steak or maybe some chicken breast, certainly some salmon for the EPA, DHA, the omega-3s, um, and legumes if, if that's their preference. And then the carbohydrate choices would be the more complex carbohydrates, the, the berries, the low sugar fruits, such as uh, blueberry, raspberry, strawberry, uh, oranges, plus their high satiety. Uh, yogurt's still in that, that meal plan uh, for everyone, women in particular, for the calcium needs, at least three servings a day. Um, and so that's, I would design that for them mostly on, on satiation and try and make sure that it, it was a, a diverse enough diet. Uh, that I'm throwing in a little bit of, you know, I've got the almonds in there and I've got the carrots in there. Uh, it's diverse enough so that you know, the gut microbiome researchers are suggesting that diversity is more important than density. Uh, and so we try and get uh, you know, plenty of foods. And then for them to have an opportunity to still incorporate some of the foods that they enjoy so that uh, it doesn't become a monotonous thing. It, it shouldn't be uh, a, a huge departure from what they enjoy. It should be what I call simple, sensible, and sustainable. Something that becomes part of a lifestyle, not something they go on and off. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. I think the most interesting thing just in talking to you, and this is the most extended conversation we've ever had, I think <clears throat> that marrying psychology and physiology is so important because yeah. psychology becomes physiology if you don't address it in some way. Stan had some great points, great advice, and things that have been working really well for me. But as with every episode, we have to go back to the research. The research is more important than what Stan has to say, what I have to say, or any individual's experience or opinion on a subject. So let's dive straight into it. Let's talk about vitamin D in specific, one of the few things that I'm instructed by Stan to take every day. Now, vitamin D is used to synthesize hormones. It has a very positive effect on mental health, and it's not in abundance when we can't synthesize it through our skin in low light times of year, like in the Canadian winter. In this one study here, supplementation of vitamin D3 resulted in a 19% increase in strength in the participants. The first flag that I put up for this is that this study is done with people who are not trained and we didn't have a control group who didn't strength train and those who did. You would need to have people who are strength trained, one group takes vitamin D, one group does not. They do the same exercise protocol and you find out how it increased. In this study, they took people, started them on a new program, and so naturally you're gonna increase your strength over the course of the program. That being said, a 19% increase is crazy. But even in the studies not reporting significant increases, strength was seen as high as 8% with things like bench press. Eight to 19% are really solid gains. They're not outside the realm of something you would expect of someone starting a new exercise regime in the first six to 12 weeks, depending on how intense and the population you're working with, but certainly a positive in the vitamin D category. Next up is magnesium. Magnesium is one of the things that helps with normal muscular contraction. Our muscles contract because nerve signals are sent from the brain down to the muscle. It disrupts a membrane. That membrane being disrupted, long story short, causes the muscle contraction. And uh, supplementing magnesium is very, very common for people who get cramps and it's extremely common for athletic performance. In this first study, a meta-analysis and systematic review, exactly what we're looking for to critique evidence to a high level, says that it does not support a beneficial effect of magnesium supplementation on muscle fitness in most athletes and physically active individuals who already have a relatively high magnesium status, but magnesium supplementation may be good for individuals with magnesium deficiency, such as alcoholics and the elderly. So this study basically says if you're using it to prevent deficiency, it works. If you're not deficient, it doesn't. But we do have a second study here where this is a, an individual study, holds less weight than the systematic review. But in this, it says significant differences in strength gains were demonstrated in magnesium versus not taking magnesium. And they hypothesized that magnesium's role may be at the ribosomal level, level in protein synthesis, AKA it might help you to build back muscle faster. With those two studies, there are no adverse effects. It's a cheap supplement with no real negative side effects. So if you're trying to get the most out of your body, magnesium doesn't seem like something that's a bad idea whatsoever. And if we're trying to leave no sun unturned and cover every element of performance, magnesium does seem like it has a role. Next, let's talk about probiotics. And probiotics in the context of ensuring positive gut health. This is something that Stan is huge on. 
and finds to be really, really important, which is why I eat so much yogurt every day. We've got two research papers here, both covering probiotics and gut bacteria and the importance of having a good gut microflora. Of course, we have the effects on gastrointestinal distress as strongmen, heartburn, really common, diarrhea, really common, these things that we don't really wanna talk about, but when you're eating such high quantities of food, taking care of your stomach is going to be of utmost importance. If your stomach isn't feeling right, there is no way that you're gonna have a huge appetite to eat a huge amount of food. Not only that, but we do see that there are mechanisms at the cellular level related to the effectiveness of probiotics in sports, although they haven't been researched enough for us to say exactly what those are and how they work. When it comes to probiotics, this also for me falls in the same category of magnesium, where there are beneficial effects for some people, but you don't know if you're one of those people or not until you start to take it. And good mi gut microflora is a little bit different than micronutrients in the sense that you can always improve that. You can always have a better digestive process. You can always feel more comfortable. You can always have a smoother process. I think one of the things that's underappreciated in the world of nutrition is that we're always talking about things going into our mouth. We're not really talking about things involved in the digestion and absorption of those nutrients because if we're not digesting and absorbing them, you're not getting them into your body at all. So it really doesn't matter what's going into your mouth. All of that being said, that is the research on some of the things that I'm doing that I really haven't done much of before. Let's get to the rankings. In terms of personal experience, I've found eating healthier foods very, very difficult because it means that I have to eat a really high quantity of foods. That being said, I think it is 100% inarguable that my body composition has changed, that I've added lean muscle tissue and that I've lost fat compared to where I was last year. If you look at pictures of me right now and compare them to me, uh, pictures of me at the Arnold last year, I'm the same body weight. I'm 325 pounds, but I look completely different and I've gotten comments on that time and time again. I think this is a really good feather in the cap for eating real whole foods, even at the same calorie consumption. Whole body inflammation will naturally go down. Your recovery will naturally improve. You can train a little bit harder and your body can use the nutrients that you're putting into your mouth a little bit better. With the scientific evidence, it's showing that there are no downsides to taking things like vitamin D and magnesium, and they really could help you, particularly if you're someone who lives in low light environments for vitamin D, or if you're someone who possibly has a propensity to be magnesium deficient. Now, let's get to practicality. How practical is it to eat good food? I'm gonna take a little bit of a tangent on this one. Usually, I just say this is practical, this is not, because the reality is, prepping and eating really high quality food is a challenge. It can be expensive, it can be time consuming. But I don't think practicality should be a real consideration when it comes to nutrition. What you put into your body is gonna dictate what your body's capable of doing and how healthy your body's going to be. For me, there's no dollar spent and no time spent that is better than taking care of your own health. So I'm gonna throw practicality out the window and say that this is extremely important. To get to my score, I give high quality nutrition a 9.84 out of 10. This lands it as number two on my list of important things to get as much out of your body as possible. And this is something that I think not only elite athletes should consider, but also the everyday person and someone who's trying to compete at a recreational level. If you're taking your training seriously and if you're taking your life seriously and your health seriously, food has to be very high on your priority list. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Turn on the notification bell. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. We're releasing a new No Stone Unturned episode every week for the next eight weeks leading into World's Strongest Man. As always, lift heavy, be kind, and we will catch you in the next video.